the race is on, and welcome to a very special video podcast where we delve into your verdict on the amazing 2021 Formula One season. We ask you to vote on the controversies, the best drives, the blunders, the heartbreaks, the disappointments, and the massive driver market moves that made a big impact on you in 2021. I'm Ed Straw, and joining me to discuss your choices and offer a few of their own are Glenn Freeman and Scott Mitchell. Well, it is of course, the time of year for reviewing the season, but as it's now officially a tradition for the race, we like to do something a little bit different, and rather than us just endlessly offering our opinions, we are going to do that as well, we're going to get you involved. So in this video podcast, we'll be finding out how you all voted in our eight categories, and also hearing some of the comments from members of the Race Members Club podcast and our YouTube community on how they voted. So, Glenn, I'd like to bring you in now. Hello. Uh, this is now officially an annual thing for the race, so can you explain a little bit more about how people could vote and just how popular these polls have been? Yeah, thanks, Ed. Uh, yeah, I love that you only have to do something twice to make it officially an annual thing. Uh, I agree with that. Uh, yeah, we, we, as you said, people spend all year listening to what we think about stuff, and... We love seeing the comments and reactions and interactions we get from our massive YouTube audience. We're so grateful to everybody who who watches the videos, who subscribe to the channel. And last year, when we came up with this idea, it was to give our audience a chance to, to influence what we talk about as we effectively review the season. It went down very well, so we wanted to do it again this year. The, the polls run on the community section of our YouTube channel. So we, we post stuff throughout the year. There are news stories, uh, polls. We get people to rate every Grand Prix. Those gets hun We get hundreds of thousands of views on that every time. So we ran eight polls for this episode that we're now discussing. And across those eight polls, I had to add it up this morning, we had uh, 1.1 million votes across all of those polls, which is, is way up on what we had last year. Um, ridiculous amount of, of comments, so so much debate that we're going to get into. And I think it just shows that this season has generated so much debate ever since it started, and obviously with the way it ended. Um, and now's a chance, as you said, for, for us to be guided much more by what the fans want to talk about and how they feel about a lot of the big topics that we're going to get into. Yeah, there's been tremendous feedback and it's been great to read through all the comments everybody has made about uh, about their way they voted and the different arguments around them. So we'll get into a little bit of that shortly. We should bring in Scott now. Obviously, normally around this time of year, we're, we're pleased to be able to put a bit of a lid on the F1 season, having basically been across it all year. But this season has been so astonishing. It's almost a shame it had to end, isn't it? Uh, yeah, it is. Um, it's also obviously a later finish. Um, so it just feels like... Uh, I don't remember a time where there wasn't a 2021 Formula One season, to be honest, but at least it was a season that kept on giving. Uh, I don't know if I'd have been able to take a 22 race year with the domination that we've seen at some points during the Mercedes Lewis Hamilton era. Um, obviously, it didn't end the way anyone wanted it to. I'm sure we're going to get into that a little bit in this podcast. I would imagine that has probably cropped up a few times in the polls. Um, but it has been a it has been a mega season. Um, I first think back to sort of where we were around testing time, and sort of talking up the possibility of this, you know, being the title challenge we're all hoping for, and getting a fair few comments saying that this was just sort of um, a media driven narrative wasn't really true. Um, it's kind of uh, it's kind of a satisfying one to be able to sit here and be like, "Told you so." Never really like throwing that back in people's faces, but I kind of feel like. The people that benefited from that and got the season that they did, I feel like you know that's one where you, you can you can take that one on the chin. Yeah, you've got to take the I told you so's when you can get them. I must admit, I can remember being at pre-season testing in Bahrain and seeing that Red Bull on track, particularly in the hands of Verstappen, and just thinking, I hope what I'm seeing here really is what we see in the season. Of course, we got that and, and then some with it, this fantastic championship battle. So let's get down to our eight categories because there's lots to talk about. In true Oscars style, we'll run through the nominees and then give you the results, hopefully not getting our envelopes confused when we do so. So first up is what was the biggest controversy of the 2021 F1 season? Hamilton and Verstappen 
Verstappen collide at Silverstone, the Belgian Grand Prix farce, Hamilton and Verstappen collide at Monza, Hamilton versus Verstappen turn four into Lagos, or the Abu Dhabi Grand Prix safety car and one lap showdown. I don't think it'll come as a surprise to anyone to learn that the Abu Dhabi Grand Prix safety car and one lap showdown won, but with 58% of the votes, also Hamilton and Verstappen Silverstone collision did very well. So Glenn, I expect you're not remotely surprised by this, but only 58% actually for, for the most recent and massive controversy. I think that says a lot for how big that Silverstone incident was, not just in terms of Max's impact with the tyre wall, but how that was the trigger really for everything that that followed in the, in the second half of the season. Obviously, Max and Lewis had had their little moments where they'd become close on track. Lewis would say that they hadn't collided up to that point because he kept get, getting out of the way and Silverstone was the time that he decided he wouldn't do that anymore. So I did wonder how the votes would be spread around. We have, we know from last year, anyone who watched this last year will know that basically every poll was won by a variation of George Russell and the Sakia Grand Prix. So we were a bit concerned about whether it's recency bias or just, just the fact that when something huge happens late in the season, it's impossible to ignore. But I think with the way the last week or so has played out, all the extra analysis that we've done, that everybody else has done, how can you look past the championship being decided in controversial fashion? You can't argue with the results. It's just fascinating that the Silverstone crash got so much as well. And I think, Ed, I saw one of our, a few of our commenters saying that it tells you a lot about the season we've had that a day as ridiculous as that Sunday at Spa got so little of the vote. Yeah, I must admit, I was thinking about this and I think in many ways what happened at Spa was a bigger controversy for me, partly because it was just so outrageous. Not the fact that they didn't have a race, that was a consequence of the weather, the way the cars are, the conditions, that was just a, an external factor that... that they couldn't do anything about but just the fact they they went through the motions of putting on an official race and then there still seems to be from what I read we, we saw a lot of comments from people saying that those who attended Spa still haven't had any clarity on what kind of recompense if any there's going to be even though F1's uh, said there has been some so almost for me the Belgian Grand Prix farce does win out in this although what happened in Abu Dhabi was a huge controversy the interesting thing is we talked a lot about this and written a lot about this and done videos about it over the past week but actually the thing I kind of need to stress on that is it's less about it deciding the championship and more just the procedures and the way the FI execute things. We could have had exactly the same outcome with that one lap shootout with Verstappen winning with the procedures done correctly if they addressed the lap cars that little bit earlier. So that's less about who won the championship and more just about the reasons they, they ran roughshod over their rules. It's, it's an interesting one. Scott, obviously, you've also been writing a huge amount about this uh, this controversy, so no great surprise. But the, the Hamilton-Verstappen one is an interesting one because I seem to remember you early in the season asking the, the drivers about the, the possibility, perhaps even the inevitability they'd, they'd come together. And getting some short shrift, it did feel like it was inevitable, didn't it? Yeah, it did. Um, maybe I can count that as another I told you so, but I probably wouldn't uh, be brave enough to say that to, to Lewis and Max. Maybe next Stop year. Stop alienating the audience, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> this is all about them. Um, no, it was it was specifically with Lewis and Max um, asking them, I think around sort of Portugal, Spain time when they started the year with this run of wheel-to-wheel -wheel battles and not quite contact. I think Imola, Imola and Spain were about as close to full-on contact as you can get without actually sort of stepping into that territory. And both of them just saying that they, there's no reason for them to get any closer than they have done. They both had massive respect for each other. They both were really enjoying the fight as well. And then, yeah, you fast forward a few a few short weeks and months and then all of a sudden it's absolutely kicking off. And I'm not surprised Silverstone ran Abu Dhabi so close. Um, I'm, you know, maybe... Um, Maybe Max, Yoss and a few Red Bull people were sat there on the polls voting for it and then refreshing and then voting again. Because I know that Red Bull and the Verstappens haven't let go of what happened at, at Silverstone. Less, they're, they're, it's amazing to me how they're still so focused on the big celebration from Mercedes and Hamilton after the race. Um, they really, really felt that was in poor taste with Max having precautionary checks in 
in hospital. And it's like Adrian Newey mentioned it after winning the title in Abu Dhabi. Jos Verstappen mentioned it in an interview that he did with Max um, for the Max's sponsor, Car Next, after the Grand Prix as well, talking about you could just you can see you can hear it in their voice, see it on their faces, just how much they really disliked what happened there. So, and I know it's obviously going to be a stronger feeling for them because they were at the heart of it. But I'm also not surprised that a lot of the fans felt it that way as well, because it was the first time that these two had collided, and it ha- and it ended up in the the single biggest shunt as well. Massive, massive impact. It's the one that set the the title battle on the path that it did. So, I yeah, that was. Um, I think that would have won in a landslide if we hadn't had the the end to the season that we did. I would just add there that I think when. We kept talking before Silverstone about will they have a proper collision at some point. We did a poll on that on our YouTube community page at the time. And I think it was something like 90% yes or something like that. Everybody could see it coming. I think deep down the drivers knew it was probably going to happen at some point as well. Yeah, irresistible force, a movable object springs to mind when it comes to that battle. It was always going to ramp up. But no surprise, really, that Abu Dhabi won out. People are going to debate this for a long time. It's quite funny, though, that this big controversy actually centres on some quite arcane rules about when you can bring the safety car in and the lap car procedures. So it's I understand why people are so het up about it, given the impact it had. But it is very much a, a kind of detail regulation application uh, debate, which just adds a little bit of... Uh, almost comedy to a rather unfortunate situation so let's see what the FIA does about that they do need to tighten up in general on the way they're operating the races and of course a few comments I've got on my uh, on my tablet here from uh, from various members club members who, who commented and also members of our YouTube community so in terms of backing Abu Dhabi a total farce that will leave casual fans bemused and confused said Sparrow One James Donald said probably the story that has had the widest reach outside F1 in years Mali Gullera said, I followed F1 for almost 40 years and have never seen anything as controversial as what happened in the season finale. I think F1 will become a laughing stock with this inconsistency, applying rules depending on the outcome. Peter Jackson said, it ruined the season finale. Cy Townsend said, I support the Brits. I wanted Hamilton to win, but I'm of sound enough mind to accept that Verstappen has been incredibly consistent this year. The finale really ruined what should have been a celebration race Either way, Herman van Hunnick said even as a duchy who on average thinks Max deserved to win, that finale was quite something. Barry Staley, the way the Abu Dhabi Grand Prix played out was on the surface shambolic, but Massey put the show rather than the sport first. There'll be arguments over the rights and wrongs for years. McCourty 89, definitely the title decider at Abu Dhabi. Both drivers have had their ups and downs throughout the season, sometimes penalised it for it within the rules and others let off from the wrath of the rules. But never in my 20 plus years of watching Formula One have I seen the rules be changed for the purposes of entertainment. Alex Lamas said both Max and Lewis drove impeccably. It was the stewarding and race control that committed the gross cock-up at the end of the Abu Dhabi Grand Prix. And Leon Trim said you can say that the Abu Dhabi incident won Max Verstappen the race, not the title. It shouldn't have been that close and Lewis got way more luck throughout the season. So slightly contrary view there. But lots and lots and lots of very, very well argued view so have a look in our youtube community section for many many more of those sorry we can't get to all of them this this video podcast will go on far 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 too long if we read them all out so let's move on to our second category which is what was the best race winning drive of the season the nominees for this are esteban ocon in hungary daniel ricardo in italy valtteri bottas in turkey max verstappen in the united states and lewis hamilton in brazil the winner for that, with 45% of the votes, was Lewis Hamilton, beating Daniel Ricciardo's Italy win by about 20%. So, Scott, any particular surprise there, given the circumstances of the Hamilton win? Uh, there was bound to be an unmuting shunt while recording this podcast, and um, I'm embarrassed to say it's me. Um I'm not sure. I think one of the one of the best things about um, one of the best things about this season was the fact that there were so many amazing uh, amazing performances, and we've had it for a couple of years now. Where even without a title challenge um, or a title narrative, there have been like amazing race by race narratives. So you could get super excited by a given weekend um, and a given performance. But one of the things that one of the things that I really liked about this year is um 
if you take the Ocon win, for example, or the Ricardo win, you have basically a completely anonymous an- anomalous result for for starters, um, and you kind of look past the fact that it's contained in an otherwise sort of average season. So then, when you have the title driver, uh, the title challenging drivers who have their result, who have their wins, you try and weigh them up. It becomes really difficult to separate which ones of Max and Lewis's performances were like considerably better than the other, because obviously an Ocon or Ricardo win is a standout. But I think, I think the the nominees that we had for Max and Lewis, I think reflected their best performances. And I just think the absolutely, frankly, over the course of the weekend, ridiculous way Hamilton won that race, I kind of thought, unless there is a genuine like anti-Hamilton rhetoric like amongst the the voting, which I don't really see any reason for there to have, have been because the community has generally been pretty fair, I think, on balance over the course of the year. Um, just the, the, the simple, you know, last to first nature of that win and the... I I actually thought the sprint race was more impressive than the the Grand Prix uh, itself. Was he overtook? I think gained fifteen places. I think he overtook. Four, he he earned fourteen of those fifteen places. The only one he didn't was Kimi Raikkonen. I think it was being being spun round. But even that incident itself cost him a place because he was just about to complete a move. I think it was on Yuki Tsunoda. <laughs> so he 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 had to properly earn that. Then got the penalty anyway for the Sunday comes back through, effectively has to pass Max twice because of the, the infamous turn four instance. That was another thing about this race. There was yet another flashpoint between the two title rivals. So yeah, when you when you try and break these down into isolation, it can be really, really difficult to find out what's sort of particularly special about one. But that Hamilton performance was so clearly a, a standout one. And it'll go it should go down once you move past all the noise about engines and straight line speed, bendy wings and all of this, it should go down as one of the standout performances of Hamilton's career. So of course it was a standout performance of the season. Yeah. It's just the unique circumstances, wasn't it? Coming from the back in qualifying and then the five place penalty as well for the Grand Prix proper. I guess Glenn, when you put together this particular poll, there was always a good chance Hamilton would, would come out on top just because he had that ridiculous win. Yeah, I think the the weekend arc of last to first made it pretty difficult to ignore. My one suspicion when we put this together was kind of what Scott hinted at about would there be almost an an anti-Hamilton vibe to this. Not necessarily personally against Lewis, but I, I was curious about how many people perhaps bought into Red Bull's narrative of, you know, the rear wing's illegal, there's something dodgy with the engine, all the straight line speed stuff. So I wondered if the votes might get spread around if people believed that that win wasn't as impressive as it looks on the surface, just by looking at kind of the, the result sheets and, and where he started and where he finished. So it's hard to argue with. the the One of the challenges of putting this poll together, firstly, was not to just fill it with Verstappen and Hamilton wins because they had so many great drives between them. But I don't know if you saw this when going through the comments, Ed, I detected a vibe of of people wanting different, sometimes do, people wanted dominant wins to be in here. And I think that's interesting that we perhaps don't look in the same way anymore at somebody winning by 30 seconds or, or a minute or something. That used to be considered really impressive a long time ago. And and now it's kind of the, the finer margins. Verstappen's win at Austin, I think, was superb because I felt that that was a race that could go either way and he was the one that made the difference uh, at a race that probably Red Bull expected to to lose to Mercedes. So I thought that was phenomenal. But I saw a lot of people saying, well, what about this race? You know, a race like Zanvoort where Max was in total control. So it's interesting to see how... I almost feel that you could, if you could put all 22 race wins in here, would the Hamilton Brazil win still win by as far as it did? Or did, were other races missing that, that we didn't choose? And it just, it's different people have different perspective of what makes a win impressive. And I think that's what we learned from the results of this poll. Yeah, I think probably the Lewis Hamilton one in Brazil was almost bridging those two different extremes, wasn't it? Because if he hadn't been down at the back, he would have just disappeared off into the distance and had a dominant 
dominant win. So almost it ticked both boxes. But I think it's the very nature of it that the sometimes the slightly more complicated races are the ones that turn on a few small things. You think of all the opportunities Hamilton had to get stuck behind somebody in that race, which we do see happening to people, even in quick cars, but it's the Hamiltons and the Verstappens who always seem to find a way to come through in these circumstances. So, yeah, I think it's it's that kind of set of circumstances that makes it stand out. But, yeah, dominant victories are not very easy to achieve. Yeah, Verstappen at Zandvoort was was a particularly good example of that. Quite a lot of support for Daniel Ricciardo, though, Scott. Second place in the poll. Uh, yeah, I think there's um, I think there's a few different factors feed into that. First of all was obviously Ricciardo's own storyline in 2021. Um, moved to McLaren, didn't work out the way he or anybody expected, was really struggling, was quite a long way off, went into the summer break absolutely dejected. Remember that image of him after the race in Hungary, which I spoke to him about, actually, uh, when I did an interview with him at the end of the year, we were talking about his sort of most dejected moments. And the irony of that image is he's not sat like crestfallen in that moment. He's assessing the damage of his uh, of his car because he said he's seen the picture that everyone was sharing. And he's like, it looks like I'm just like hunched, like slumped over. Absolutely. But he's like, he's looking to see if he can spot some of the damage, basically. But he does agree that image, one misrepresentative in terms of what it was actually showing, absolutely symbolises where he was at the end of that. So it's just that, it's just a weird sort of, I guess, irony of that situation. So you had that because it was almost like a sudden redemption for him. It ended a wind drought for him as well, which goes back to, went back to, I think, 2018 Monaco. So there was that. It was the McLaren situation as well. Uh, ended a wind drought for McLaren, which I guess went back to the final race of 2012. So that was huge. And we know that McLaren's an awfully popular team. It was a McLaren 1-2. And I think the only 1-2 of the season, um, which is just frankly out, just ridiculous. Imagine predicting that at the start of the year, that the only team to get a 1-2 would be McLaren. And obviously, while it the race itself featured Hamilton and Verstappen colliding, it was also a race won on merit. You know, Ricardo had moved into a position, taken advantage of a few situations in the sprint and then the start of the Grand Prix, took the lead. He was holding his own in that situation. And yeah, the final part of the race might have played out differently if Hamilton had been able to hunt Ricardo down. But it wasn't that Ricardo needed half a dozen cars to fall out the way. To It wasn't... I don't want to take anything away from Ocon's win, for example, in Hungary, which... Or, you know, like Gasly's win at Monza the year before. You know, these other one-off midfield wins. Ricardo was sort of like the most merited of these kind of midfield wins. So there was that element too. So just... All these things came together to make it something absolutely crazy. And just a, just one way, even like as a, an independent journalist, you take there, there's no shame in taking joy and in and in, in just reveling in the situation. It's one I feel like almost everybody can appreciate. It's not just oh that's one for the neutrals. It's just like they're, they're, everyone's a neutral in that situation because everyone's happy with with the outcome. Let's see what our community said, both on YouTube and from the Race Members Club, on Lewis Hamilton getting the best winning drive. Matthew Wyatt said he had the machinery to do it, but last to first is kind of epic regardless. C.D. Partridge says Lewis was on a mission. Michael Abbott, Michael Abbott describes Lewis Hamilton as on a different level the entire weekend. Matthew McCarthy says a 25-place grid penalty to victory. Incredible achievement in any circumstances, let alone against the backdrop of an incredibly tight championship battle with no margin for error. Barbara Woodward simply says, pure class. Martin Mortlake, one of the greatest comebacks in F1 history. Our Borkhouse says, as you've all described it before, imperious, unthinkable right before the sprint. So high leverage in the championship fight and no room for error. Maybe also remarkable for allowing a surprise at a Hamilton win. Aditya Banerjee said, I'm not a Lewis fan, but Brazil was a once in a lifetime performance, even among his high standards. Even Jetta said, I have to vote for Hamilton in Brazil because overtaking 25 cars when there's only 20 on the grid in order to secure a race win and outdrive and outclass Verstappen along the way is pretty epic. And Rohit Raj said, Lewis won because of his super spy engine absolutely no one was anywhere near close to his speed it was really good no doubts but still yeah that's the the, the red bull uh narrative i think uh the mercedes package was certainly very fast in in brazil but i'm not sure the engine was quite as 
ridiculously overpowered and monstrous as Red Bull suggested and certainly the speed chat figures and the data bore that out let's move on to the next category which is what was the biggest story of 2021 the nominees are the Verstappen versus Hamilton rivalry the flexi wing arguments rumors of Audi and Porsche coming to F1 sprint races or McLaren and Alpine taking surprise wins and I guess no great surprise that the overwhelming winner in this with 86% of the votes was the Verstappen versus Hamilton rivalry. I guess, Glenn, that was 2021. This is what people are going to talk about forever, isn't it? Yeah, that that, that result is as it should be, really. Um, I, I think... I've been I've been looking back at the, the great rivalries we've had in the past and trying to compare them to this one. I think these guys have crammed more into a single season than Senna and Prost crammed into two or three seasons of, of batting for championships and, 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 and colliding um, certainly more than say Schumacher or Hill and more flashpoints. There's been more flashpoints this season between these two than I can think of in any other rivalry that spanned multiple seasons. So it had to be the winner and, um, this was one of the polls where we, I think we got a lot of feedback of people saying, why isn't the Abu Dhabi thing in there? Firstly, we, we didn't want to talk about it in every poll. We've made, I think, six videos about it already. I've lost count, to be honest. Um, we've talked about it enough. It, it, we, it was in one of the other polls. It was deliberately left out of this one. I'm slightly curious if we hadn't had that rivalry, what would have won out of the other options and maybe another one that could have been put in. But yeah, there's no argument with this result. Uh, it's what I expected before we posted it. And yeah, this this is going down in F1 history. It's Sometimes it's difficult when you're witnessing something at the time to know how it will be viewed in the future. And if it's as big a deal as it feels at the time, this one, there's no doubt about it. This has been huge, and I can only hope that we've got more of it to come. I I, I like the way you described it, Glenn, as um, being something that sort of fit in two or three seasons worth of storylines, effectively, because you did have this incredible narrative packed into the span of about nine months, where you had the um, the initial sort of sparring, but a flashpoint even in the first race that controversy over the the track limits and the interpretation of it. And then sort of like the gradual escalation in the first few Grand Prix, both, you know, trading punches, but doing so respectfully. No one's really taking any sort of cheap shots. And then it it just gradually cranks up. I think off track around, I think it would have been Monaco time. Lewis said something about Max having a bit more to prove. Then there was a bit of Max and Christian Horner hitting back. After the Grand Prix, obviously Max won. Lewis was muted and outside of off the podium because he had a difficult weekend max said something like um that shows you just need to do all your talking on the track and it's just this needle just it just increasing tension and just getting a little bit a little bit more but again still very respectful and then it all changes at silverstone so not only do you have the crash not only do you have them finally colliding you have massive impact for one driver you have a huge championship turning point. Lewis suddenly right back in the fight. There's genuine bitterness afterwards. Max joining in as well with criticising the reaction. Then a couple of races later, they collide again. Max says over the radio something like, you know, that's what you get if you don't leave space, which obviously a lot of pe- a lot of Hamilton fans especially interpreted to be, oh, we know Max clearly didn't have a problem if they hit this. Wolf, Toto Wolf referred to it as like a tactical foul. And so so you're getting into this situation where the the longer the season goes on for the relationship that we've only seen very, very briefly in this respectful, hardcore rivalry phase in the first few races has suddenly deteriorated to the point where by the time we're in Abu Dhabi and you've had the antics of Saudi Arabia and the controversy of the turn four incident in Brazil, Verstappen says on the eve of the race in Abu Dhabi that this season has changed his opinion of Hamilton and Mercedes and for some reason he felt compelled to state not in a positive way which I think we all could all work out that's what he was getting at but the fact that he was he was moved enough to you know say that without blinking just very very clear there was such a deterioration almost an incomplete it was like the it was like the respect and relationship 
very, very briefly hit a peak at the start of the year and then over the next few months just collapsed entirely. And we've already seen, I think, since the end of the Grand Prix and a little bit over the weekend itself, a softening of that position to the point where it seems to have faded into a position of the respect is clearly still there. There's still underlying respect. And I think it will get to the point where it might never be as heated as it has been this year. So it's therefore repairable. But that doesn't detract from the fact that at one point this season, it looked like those two people, I think at times they hated one another. I think it, com- it comes down to that. It might only be brief, it might be fleeting, heat at the moment, adrenaline pumping, all of that. But you can't tell me that there weren't points this year where those two drivers just seriously disliked one another. It's such a defining rivalry that it's almost impossible to imagine this season without it. But I think to answer that question you posed, Glenn, I do wonder if that didn't happen, if the sprint races, which only got 2% of the vote, would have been the big deal. Only three of them, but a seismic change to the way that the Grand Prix weekend format works with a very big impact. Yeah, and they they are still controversial because F1 is able to point to incidents and excitement that happened on those weekends as a way of justifying the sprint race format I still think there are a lot of questions particularly from fans about if the sprint race works as a format we're going to get more of them I like I liked the impact Scott mentioned it earlier the 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 Ricardo Monza win was I think a, a genuine positive or a regular positive impact of the sprint race where you make a little bit of progress with a good start and and, and a sensible race on the Saturday and you put yourself in a better position than you could have put yourself in through qualifying to then have a better race. I don't think we can judge the sprint races on the fact that they caused two collisions between the championship contenders and you had all the excitement of Hamilton coming from the back and then taking another grid penalty and then coming through from the middle of the pack. Those are freak occurrences. I know anyone who supports the sprint race would say that those freak occurrences happen because of the sprint race format. I, I think F1 got lucky there, really. I'm I'm yet to be totally convinced by the format change, but I'm more than happy to see F1 try this stuff in the real world. I'd much rather have the argument about an actual example of these things happening than just having an argument where we're all guessing what might have happened. Yeah, a sample set of three events isn't quite enough to draw definitive conclusions. It clearly increases the scope for stuff happening because there is more happening and it's a positive to have action on all three days, meaningful action, shall we say, on all three days of a Grand Prix meeting. But yeah, the, the format does need some some sharpening up. So let's see what, uh, what our community had to say about the, the biggest story and the fact that it was the Verstappen-Hamilton rivalry. Matthew Wyatt simply asked, will there be another season like it? I'm hoping next year. Let's that, that, go with the optimistic response for that. Uh, Michelle Wallstra says, the best and craziest title fight I've seen since I started following F1 in 1997. Both drivers were almost perfect, whereas in other years, drivers would often make clear and obvious mistakes. I'm not sure when we'll ever see another title fight like this again. Gordon David Ross says it will go down in history as one of the greatest battles long after the last lap controversy fades into memory. Parkour Fifth says both deserve to win. Shame it couldn't have been a draw. John Nolan says it got out of hand more than once and the fan rivalry made social media a toxic space. But they were out of everyone else's league and so closely matched all the way to the end. Leo Dwyer said pre-Silverstone it was regular spicy racing with a bit of elbows out. But after cops and the immediate fallout, things turned personal. Jamsler said this story was too big, creating animosity, distracting from other achievements and working to the detriment of the sport. Savian Presley says 100% Verstappen v Hamilton. This championship will be talked about for decades to come. Justin Williams said this was the easiest one. Stories about team politics, technical aspects, etc. are interesting to a lot of people, but pale when you consider two great talents driving two great cars for two great teams. And Durant Eckstein says, I'm not a Hamilton fan, but the man has a talent. Verstappen and Hamilton's feud will go down in history as one of the greatest, if not the greatest. I really hope 2022 brings Verstappen versus Hamilton round two I think we can also we can all get behind the hope that next year is going to be a similar thing perhaps even with some other drivers involved 
Next up we have our fourth category, which is what was the biggest blunder of 2021. The nominees for that are Schumacher crashes under safety car conditions at Imola, Hamilton slides off the road at Imola, Hamilton's Baku restart break magic error, Bottas triggers a massive pileup in Hungary, and McLaren's strategy costs Norris victory in Russia. The winner in this one with 57% of the vote is Hamilton's Baku restart break magic error. Scott, did this one surprise you? A few maybe strong contenders in this one? Uh, no, nothing surprised me quite like this because this was um, a, a purely individual error. Understandable though it may be because it's easy in that situation with um, what the the button that Hamilton accidentally pressed does and also just in terms of its location. And if anything, it's one of those where you're like, no, it's happened. I'm surprised this hasn't happened before almost because the button's just right by where his hand is at, um, for the start on the steering wheel. Um, but it's just like, you know, the a couple of the others, they're mitigated by conditions and, 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 and stuff like that. Um, so there are other variables, if you see what I mean. So it's kind of like you can always, you can always make an excuse or justify any error but those ones just a bit more reasonable. This one was an out and out mistake, but it was also just in terms of the cost of it, just absolutely enormous. Um, and for a brief moment or after it happened, everyone's thinking, I can't believe Hamilton has made that misjudgment. He's just come out, you know, it was pre especially it was preempted by his radio message when I think they were still in the pit lane saying, you know, it's a marathon, not a sprint. The idea being they don't do anything stupid at the restart to, um, you know, gamble and, and cost themselves. So it looked like Lewis had just completely failed to heed his own advice and gone barreling into turn one. And that re wasn't really what happened. It, it, he made a mistake that meant when he touched the brakes, things absolutely didn't happen the way they should have done in that situation. So it wasn't, it wasn't him defying his own advice. It was just he'd made a different error that then caught him out and it turned what should have been a 25-point a gain on Verstappen which, you know, these things don't happen in isolation. Probably we don't have what happens at Silverstone. Probably we don't have what happens... The, se the, the season takes a completely different narrative because Hamilton's got an extra 25 points in the bank. The dynamic between the two, what what they have to hang on to, what they have to, how they have to engage in one another, it all changes. So it was a, it was a tiny, tiny error with absolutely huge consequences and that's why it ends up becoming the biggest blunder overall yeah i completely agree with that the the, the stakes were huge max verstappen had that race under control until he had his huge bit of misfortune hamilton was handed a golden opportunity on a plate and in the end it doesn't matter how small or trivial the actual error that he made was the consequences of it and the fact that it cost him that chance to take advantage of, to use football terms, that was an open goal. Uh, it, Yeah, the, the consequences were huge, so you can't look past it for being the biggest error, even though, in many ways, the other blunders that are on here were required somebody to do something worse, if that kind of makes sense. Yeah, you, you could make a, a strong argument for the Bottas-Hungry mistake. Now, to be very clear about this, that was an honest mistake. It, it is easily done in wet conditions. He made a slight misjudgment, hit the back of Norris, but it's just the fact that it, it had this massive, massive impact catching out both of the Red Bulls. It wasn't a million miles off taking Hamilton out as well. So it was just one of those good old school first corner wipeouts you don't, don't often see. And of course, Lance Stroll got involved in that as well and, and took out Leclerc. So that that was one that had very, very big consequences as, as well and obviously fed into the... Uh, the, the 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 aggro between Red Bull and Mercedes as well, but it was just one of those things. It was a, a, a genuine accident. But yeah, the brake magic, winding all your brake bias forward when you're trying to outbreak Sergio Perez at the start to, or the restart, I should say, to win a Grand Prix, has to go down as quite a big error. And obviously they they changed the brake magic button. They they sort of put it in a little sort of recessed add-on around it so you couldn't do it but yeah by then the damage of course had been done let's see what our community had to say about uh, the Hamilton blunder James Donald said so many moments could have been said to sway the championship but that 
was a huge unforced error. Michael Abbott calls it a schoolboy error. Mally Guller says without it, Lewis Hamilton is an eight-time champion. John Nolan says considering the psychological blow and ultimately the championship-altering impact, it's hard to see past that tiny slip of Hamilton's finger. Neil Macy says the others feel like understandable mistakes. Hamilton's Baku error was more foolish and ultimately has cost him. M. Kloss said that one felt so much more unnecessary compared to everything else on the list. Sigmund Ferd said, I can still hear Weber's scream, music to my ears, reference to his commentary. Ricky Spanish says, break magic mistake was the biggest mistake. It was something Hamilton had complete control over and could have been avoided. All the others had external factors. Asa Luta says, Hamilton's back of break magic was a hilariously unfortunate and critical error costing in the championship like China 2007. And Valkenberger said, I always feel silly when I select the wrong mode on my PlayStation F1 game. I used to think professionals won't ever make this error. Now that's all different. Very good for my self-confidence. So some great comments there. And as I say, you can have a look through our YouTube community section to read many, many more comments. There's, there's thousands of, of great things to read on there. There is plenty more of your verdicts to come, but first, we'd like to let you know that this video podcast is sponsored by Esso. Esso's Premium Fuel Synergy Supreme Plus 99 contains Esso's highest octane fuel level ever and an extra dose of benefit and an extra dose of beneficial additives compared to Esso's regular fuel, which can help to improve your engine's performance. Synergy Supreme Plus 99 unleaded fuel also contains molecules that help to reduce friction in your engine, helping the moving parts work more efficiently. Head to so.co.uk to find out more. And now, let's get back to probably the most agonising of our categories. This is what was the biggest heartbreak of 2021. The nominees for this are Leclerc not able to start from pole position in Monaco, Leclerc loses the British Grand Prix win in the closing stages, Vettel loses his hungry podium after disqualification, Norris misses out on Russian Grand Prix victory, and Hamilton loses the F1 title on the last lap in Abu Dhabi. The winner in this category was Norris misses out on Russian Grand Prix victory with 43% of the vote. Glenn, what did you make of that one? An easy choice for Norris or were you surprised? Um, a little bit surprised because we talked earlier about worrying that anything related to Abu Dhabi would win every single poll. I think that reflects perhaps the, the popularity of Norris and McLaren. The fact that it would have been a maiden victory as well for Lando. The fact that he drove so well um, and, and looked so powerless when when it all went wrong. So, yeah, I, I'm quite uh, I'm quite pleased to see that one that one win. Um, the I wonder the Leclerc Monaco one was a big one for me just because you know he, he's from Monaco. It Ferrari had had such a tough 2020 the car looks so good on street circuits i i personally love the idea of him getting to start his home race from pole position and obviously have such a good chance to win it and and, and then the way the the way it all unraveled for him but, you know just before going to the grid just before going to the start of the race um that one was really really painful but i think that reflects that in many ways this was quite a a competitive field because you've got a last lap loss of a world championship in con uh, controversial controversial circumstances you've got the Norris one that we've we've discussed all the reasons that was heartbreaking even even the Vettel one getting a reasonable amount of the of the vote is interesting I did wonder if there wouldn't be any sympathy for a technical disqualification obviously it wasn't Sebastian's fault but it's interesting to, I think that reflects perhaps the popularity he's generated for himself in recent years. So yeah, it's it's very hard. I'm not going to argue against those results. I think it, it I think it reflects quite well on on the fan base in many ways that the 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 Lando uh Sochi dilemma uh re really seemed to touch people and and as I say let's I think let's hope that it's not too long before he gets to put that right. I think with this one I'm with the 11% on Leclerc. Because I think heartbreak, those circumstances you explained, yes, 
it was a consequence of his own mistake in qualifying. Obviously, the damage that Ferrari didn't detect was actually on the opposite side of the car, so they didn't look quite close enough. But just that moment when he radioed it in, we heard, all heard that radio message. You can actually hear the heartbreak in that message, which I think just ticks the box for, for that. Scott, what would you have gone for in this category? I, I would have gone with the the, the title, Lewis, Lewis losing the title. I'm surprised it, it that that wasn't. We talked earlier about you know the more recent the event is the sort of more sway that has in people's memory anyway but just just in terms of just being able to tangibly quantify what's been lost there's nothing bigger than the world championship so you've dominated the final grand prix of the season having got ahead of your title rival and everything's been under control and you're about you're on the brink of an unprecedented eighth world championship and then you see or hear that a Williams has stuffed it into the barriers. You get the call that it's a safety car. And then you go through those last, those four minutes in particular where it changed. They were moving the lapped cars out of the way. And then it was clear that the race was going to restart with that one lap. You know that he's behind you on the softs. You're still on your million year old hard tyres as well. There must be such a sinking feeling there. And then when Verstappen gets in front, you know that there's no real coming back. I mean, Hamilton put up a boot, as good a fight as he could. I can't imagine what that feeling is like. And lost wins are obviously horrible enough, but to lose a win and in the process lose a championship through absolutely no fault of your own, nothing that you could have done differently at any point, I just think is, um, yeah, uh, an incalculable feeling of, of dread and, how your stomach must sink in that situation so I'm genuinely surprised that didn't win yeah I almost think of that as more frustration and anger and fury than than than, uh, than heartbreak and of course one person's heartbreak is another one's great triumph isn't it, and it there was uh that was no heartbreak in the the Red Bull and Verstappen camp at that uh, at that last lap Pass. But let's have a look at some of our community comments on the heartbreak for Norris. Timothy June said, after Belgium, this was truly a heartbreak for Norris. C.D. Partridge said, felt really bad for Lando. He will learn, and although it was his bad call, he had earned that victory. Simon Ems says, with the constant excellence that Norris de- delivered in 2021, he should have had a victory to crown his achievements. Michael Abbott said, so hard for them to call that right. The disadvantage of running first in changeable weather. MPH GP81 says, being so close to a first victory and having it taken away is heartbreaking. And Yanis van der Waal said, Norris controlled that race from start to finish. Only an external factor destroyed it for them. Jaden says, it was so frustrating watching Lando stay out on slicks. He'll get his first win soon enough, though. Brian Harris watching Norris sliding around and lose the number one place in Russia was pure pain and agony. I don't think he's ever fully recovered mentally from that. Alyssa Lucero said, I'm not even a Norris fan, but watching him do so well throughout a year and then missing out on his maiden win because of a 50-50 call to change his tyres was incredibly upsetting. And Kyron McGuinness said, Norris was so close, but inexperience got the better of him, hoping he's learned an important lesson from that and goes on to win many races. And of course, that was the extra dimension, wasn't it? Was it the driver or the team's fault? And I have to say, looking at the the pace and the, the fact there was that second bank of rain, I tend to put the blame more with the team, not detecting that that next chunk of rain was going to hit. But that's going to be debated for a great many years. The next question is, what was the biggest disappointment of 2021? Our nominees there are Aston Martin, Daniel Ricciardo at McLaren, Sergio Perez at Red Bull, Yuki Tsunoda at Alfa Tari, and F2 champion Oscar Piastri not getting an F1 drive for 2022. The winner there with 41% of the vote was Aston Martin. Now, Scott, this was a really interesting category. I was slightly surprised with Aston Martin, but how about you? Um, I think uh, I think given the fact that that team in a different identity won a race in 2020 and it was the... It was an evolution of the, well, the pink Mercedes became a green Mercedes uh, and the car it was fundamentally based on was able to be improved in a way that let Mercedes fight for the Drivers' Championship and win the Constructors' Championship, whereas Aston Martin just took a colossal backward step. First year for that organisation with that branding, Sebastian Vettel on board, four-time world champion joining the team, so much ambition, so much expectation. They fell miles short. So I understand that because it's it's a 
it's a season long constant period of failure isn't it or underachievement from start to finish whereas all the others again sort of some mitigating circumstances are, are, are around them like there is for Aston Martin because obviously they were lamenting the rule changes the floor rule changes but ultimately Mercedes did a job to be able to address that and Aston Martin didn't and wasn't able to so yeah I was one of many people who was upset and felt it was ridiculous that Piastri hasn't got a Formula One seat for 2022, but it isn't the end of his career and hopefully he can make good on it. I do feel that was a massive injustice. But if you're looking at the scope of an entire F1 organisation under the, a brand like Aston Martin underachieving, I think that, that has to take this win. What would you have gone for, Glenn? Would you have got behind the Aston Martin vote or would you have gone elsewhere? Well, I, I, I should say I voted on all of these polls. Um, so it's not what would I have gone for? What did I go for? It was Aston for me. Um, for all the reasons Scott has outlined, you know, this this team was set up to, to, to take the next step. It had what should have been a, a baked in advantage. I think they made far too much of the of the floor changes, uh, scuppering them. I didn't like all the fuss they made about that for a long while through the season. The key with Aston Martin is that hopefully there won't be a knee-jerk reaction internally at the top of that team. It does look like all of the building blocks are being put in place with the factory, with the investment, with the recruitment, that there's still an understanding that success in Formula One requires you to play the long game. And... I think they they found a shortcut in 2020 and reaped the rewards from that fantastically. This year was a reminder that shortcuts don't, shortcuts can come back to bite you, perhaps. And the I, I was worried when it started to go wrong. I was worried that the the atmosphere within the team might become trigger happy and that heads would start rolling. I hope that hasn't happened. I hope it doesn't happen. They're still on the right path, but they've had a really important reminder of just how difficult it is. It What made this category so interesting for me is that it's one of the ones where we had quite a few of the options getting a decent percentage of of the vote. The, the Piastri one, I think, is fascinating. It, it really shows that F1 fans aren't always hugely engaged in the junior ladder, but when you get a talent like Piastri who has... The CV that he has pre what he's done in F2 as well, that's a that's a Lewis Hamilton CV. That's a, a Lando Norris, a George Russell, a Charles Leclerc. Those are the those are the drivers we're talking about who have done what he's done throughout the junior ranks. He's that good. I hope, like Scott and like everybody else, that this is a temporary pause to his career momentum. We've seen that sort of thing in the past. You know, Fernando Alonso did a year of F1 at the back. And then had to to bide his time on the sidelines before getting a Renault drive. Same team, of course, uh, Team Enstone. So hopefully he can take something from his year on the sidelines. Ocon had it, obviously, recently. George Russell spent three years driving around at the back and has now got his chance at Mercedes. Piastri's that good that this hopefully doesn't derail him. The big question, I guess, is if... Alpine are competitive under the new rules next year. Fernando Alonso is not going to want to leave. Esteban Ocon's on a long contract. Is it then Alpine's responsibility to find Piastri a drive somewhere else on the grid? Yeah, that's a big question. I'd be much more disappointed if Piastri is not on the grid in 2023 than this year, uh, earning the drive this year with his performance. It's not that he doesn't deserve an F1 chance, but sometimes, as you said, this happens. So it's a little bit disappointing, but it would go into something, a whole new level if he doesn't get uh, an opportunity in 2023 somewhere. I must confess, I was inclined to vote for Sergio Perez on this one. Now, we had quite a bit of criticism for even including Perez in this, but I'd argue if you don't think Perez has been a disappointment this season, you probably don't think he's very good because he had five podiums, five podiums. Verstappen won 10 races in that car. I wasn't expecting Perez to be beating Verstappen all the time. I was expecting him to be a strong number two. He had moments this season where he did well. Baku was very good. What he did in Abu Dhabi was excellent. There was a good run of races a little bit towards the end of the season. But 
Yeah, I, I was a little bit disappointed with Perez. I think he's a very good driver, good all-round classy performer, and I don't think he showed it consistently enough this year, and ultimately that's what cost Red Bull the Constructors' Championship. Yeah, I think um, I'm I'm willing to take most of the responsibility for these polls. I, I do organise them with, with the help of you guys and, and our team at the race, but uh, I am going to throw you under the bus here, Ed. I, Perez wasn't on my draft list for this one. I, I kind of get that you might have want to have seen a little bit more from him. And I think it's important that we don't uh, judge his season just on the great job he did at Abu Dhabi. I, I'm fully in the camp that Perez did a phenomenal job with the clever way that he held Hamilton up to play his role for Verstappen. Uh, but it, he didn't come to mind for me as one of the obvious disappointments of this season. Sonoda certainly did. Um, I think we had very high hopes for him. And it, my concern there was just that the progress wasn't consistent. I, I didn't see him kind of generating, uh, building up his experience and, and improving his performances as a result. He finished with that decent race in Abu Dhabi that none of us, none of us really noticed. And I think Scott made a comment about, he said he finally felt he got back to where he was at the start of the year. My question now would be, why did it take you another 21 races to get back to the point you were at the start. So that one was a concern for me. And, and we've talked about Ricardo already. I'm, I wouldn't be surprised if Daniel would have voted for himself, to be honest. Yeah, I'm I'm happy to be blamed for Perez being in, in the list, but I had quite high expectations of him. I thought he'd be a, a stronger number two. I think he will be better next year. But again, yeah, I, I think if, if he wasn't disappointing you to some extent, then he probably people were not rating him at the level that, that I was so perhaps perhaps I was guilty of uh, overrating him there but let's see what people had to say about the disappointment of the season and why they went for Aston Martin R. Alnut says just flat and uninspiring development MPHGP81 says I expected more from Aston Martin especially after last season I know the rule changes in between 20 and 21 hurt the low rate cars but Mercedes appear to get a handle on it R. Borkhouse said looked on the rise after last year's results upgraded branding investment and lineup changes can't imagine this is what they expected to get for it John Nolan said they were caught short by the reg changes and showed how big the knowledge gap to Mercedes really was Jamie Willis said if they haven't moved on strongly by this time next year they will presumably be some hard questions asked E Bergman said a really lacklustre year considering the resources and a successful 2020 the interestingly named very evil person from Illuminati said I didn't buy into the hype that they were going to be regularly winning races this year and whatnot but getting stranded in seventh place in a no man's land ahead of Alfa Romeo and Williams yet a, yet a long way behind Alfa Tari and Alpine I did not expect that. Sondant said definitely Aston Martin maybe I just expected too much from them since they signed Vettel at the end of 2020 but I never thought the new technical rules would screw them over so much in 2021. Carol N. describes Aston Martin as an epic fail. Stroll actually had me convinced they'd be able to compete with Mercedes and Red Bull. So gutted for Vettel. I hope next year he'll have a better car. And Selden Schuert said Aston just weren't performing at the rate I was expecting them to. The cars had the pace in them. We've seen that with a couple of Seb's drives this year. There was just no consistency at all, with the exception of the consistent finishes outside of the points. So plenty of support for Aston Martin as the disappointment of the year. We'll move on to our seventh category now, which is always a fun one. What was the best non-winning drive of 2021? So as it sounds, this is the best race performance that didn't result in a win. The nominees are Charles Leclerc for the British Grand Prix, Fernando Alonso at the Hungarian Grand Prix, Max Verstappen also at the Hungarian Grand Prix, Valtteri Bottas at the Italian Grand Prix, and Lando Norris at the Russian Grand Prix. Now, Glenn, another strong showing for Lando Norris here. 48% of the votes, he won. Yeah, I, I, sometimes you have that where you have an incident or a race or a story that can sit in a lot of of categories and we've we've discussed it already i think people people really connected with what lando did that day and and his his momentum up to that point of the season it was interesting we had that comment earlier about if he if he truly recovered from it i i hope that wasn't the case i don't think it it did him any damage but i can see why people would draw that conclusion because his the McLaren season in many ways tailed off th really through misfortune rather than anything else. The I think it's interesting to look at what was second here, the Alonso Hungarian Grand Prix. 
we had a debate when we put this together. Was the Alonso Hungary drive that helped Ocon? And the most memorable part of that drive was, of course, delaying Lewis Hamilton for so long. Was that drive better than Fernando's own podium in Qatar when he did such a good job to manage the tyres to get to the end? And Ocon managed to return the favour ever so briefly uh, when, when the order was to defend like a lion. In fairness, Fernando had a track where I think it was easier to defend like a lion than than it was for Ocon, but Ocon made a difference. But what I really enjoyed about that Alonso drive was it was that lesson to younger drivers in F1 or trying to get to F1 of how to how to get your elbows out, how to be tough, how, how to race really hard, but never overstep the line. Hamilton played a role in that as well. He, he he was aggressive, but showed the right amount of caution because he had so much at stake. So both of those drivers deserve credit for that. And that's one of the things, driving standards has been a huge topic of conversation this year. And something I think that gets overlooked is that the driver being overtaken or the driver defending sometimes deserves credit for knowing when they're beaten. And I think Hamilton and Alonso throughout this battle both knew when when they'd reached the edge of what, what they were allowed to do. Um, and I can see why this one got so much of the vote because it played such a role in Ocon winning the race. So it contributed to a, a surprise win. Obviously, it didn't it didn't beat the Norris performance, but um, it got my vote. And there was a lot to like about that performance from Alonso, certainly. Yeah, the Alonso one I went for simply because it was 11 laps where just Hamilton's progress in catching Ocon just stopped. Before that, he was catching him at a rate of knots. After it, he did as well. But just Alonso's you shall not pass act just completely froze the race for for Hamilton, which I thought was really, really impressive. So it's an unusual one. That's why I like that one so much. Uh, so much. What did you go for, Scott? Um, I I liked Leclerc's drive at, at, at Silverstone. Um, just because in that situation, and maybe this is less about, in hindsight, maybe this is less about Leclerc's drive and more about the um, less incompetence of the other two but in a race in which Verstappen and Hamilton are out of the picture which two cars should be winning that Grand Prix it's not the Ferrari is it it's the other Red Bull and the other Mercedes and the fact that it wasn't it was Leclerc that was in this position um, I just thought was super impressive and for a while I know obviously Hamilton had the big car advantage but for a while I was thinking Leclerc might be doing enough here. This is a really, really great effort. And I've picked that because there was, um, when I compare it to the Lando one at Sochi, that Leclerc didn't lose that race because of anything he did. And while I completely understand why Lando made the decision he did and why he wouldn't, um, it would rightly not sort of regret what he did too much in the moment in Russia with the information he was being given and the fact that it was basically him and Hamilton were going to go opposite one another because on track it was only going one way. There, there was still that variable in, in Russia where Lando could have played it safe if he wanted to. He could, he could have decided, actually, do you know what? No, I could change tyres and he didn't. So while I believe that McLaren's primarily at fault for him not winning that race, there was still whether you call it 5% or 50% or whatever, there's still an element of blame there for, for Lando. So I totally get why he won this because it was fantastic and it was it was super unfortunate. I just, Leclerc's was one of those where it's like, it's so easy to forget that drive. Like at the end of the year, it's super easy to just go, don't remember who finished second in that race or how close they came to winning or how absurd it would have been if they'd won. So, yeah, I think um, I think Leclerc was mega at Silverstone. He also had he had those engine problems earlier in the race as well. We, I'm not sure we ever got to quantify how much that cost him, but you also have to wonder, with how late in the race he got caught by Hamilton, if he had enough of those power dips that they cost him enough time, again, there's an element of, of misfortune there that was completely out of his hands and you just have to wonder it would have been such a great reward for how his season was going up to that point 
I'm very curious to see how Ferrari start next year because I felt that once they had a handle on McLaren in that battle for for third in the constructors, and once they had their their engine upgrade, they Sainz and Leclerc were very consistently at the front of the midfield pack, but it felt they got further and further away from the leaders. So I do wonder if Ferrari sort of went in the second half of the season, maybe other than the engine upgrade, did kind of switch off a bit for this year. So I really hope, we mentioned it earlier, we want Hamilton versus Verstappen too, but we want some Ferraris and some McLarens and anyone else that can get there involved as well. So I'm very interested to see who can be leading that pack and where Ferrari end up. I've also got to take this opportunity to, as we do like to on the Race F1 podcast, briefly visit Valtteri Bottas Sympathy Corner. Not many people voted for his Italian Grand Prix performance, 4% of the vote, but he was the dominant driver that weekend. It's just that he had the back of the grid power unit change penalty, took what's not officially pole position, but really was pole position, won the sprint race and had to start from the back, came through to finish third. So I think, while I wouldn't have voted for Bottas in this one, I think he deserved a bit more than 4% of the votes. But Let's hear from our community now. Because we heard so much about Norris's heartbreak previously, I've actually picked out a few people commenting on the various drivers that lost in this category for a bit of variety. So first up, the, the Alonso supporters. E. Bergerman says Alonso gets it for his thrilling defence. Harman van Hunnick said arguably the driver of the season. And Yanis van der Waal said the best defensive masterclass to be seen in a long time. And of those backing Charles Leclerc, Jared Madsen said, I think it's one of the best ones because he was in a good position to capitalise on others' mistakes, didn't make any mistakes the whole race, and lasted out in front a lot longer than what people expected. Matthew McCarthy said, only an inspired Lewis Hamilton on home soil could prevent Leclerc taking what would have been an incredibly impressive victory. To beat Bottas's superior Mercedes was a display of Leclerc's brilliance, and I hope for our given the machinery to fight at the front where he undoubtedly has the talent to be. And Del Nevo said, Leclerc at Silverstone is being overlooked here. I was at that race and he was ahead in the first stint on merit. Only once the hard tyres were on was Hamilton faster. An unreal drive in an altogether unlucky season. And there are a few Bottas supporters. Jonathan Reynolds said Bottas in Monza was underrated. One of the best weekends of the season. Pole position, P1 in the sprint race, only to start from the back and come back to P3 in the race. Yes, he had some luck with Max and Lewis taking each other out, but still last to P5 would have been pretty impressive regardless. And Paul Rohr Johansson said Bottas taking third from 20th in Monza was pretty epic. And also Max Verstappen's drive in a damaged car in Hungary to ninth. Syndicate Gaming said Max's drive in Hungary is underrated. The damage he had made his car pretty much as bad as the Haas, but he still finished P9. And Flick Hess said Verstappen getting a points finish in a car which must have been borderline undrivable really stands out for me. And we can now move on to our eighth and final category. What's the biggest driver move for 2022? The nominees in this are George Russell to Mercedes, Valtteri Bottas to Alfa Romeo, Alex Albon to Williams, and Guan Yu Zhou to Alfa Romeo. Just the four nominees in this category because there's only four driver changes for next year. The overwhelming winner here with 81% of the vote is George Russell. Scott, I guess you saw that one coming. Yeah, I can't be surprised by that at all. Um, huge, um, huge disrespect on Guan Yu Zhou. Put some respect on his name. What an exciting move that is for Formula One. Um, Ru no, Russell to Mercedes, it's it's so easy. To, again, it, like, very different example. So easy to forget that happened <laughs> earlier this year. There was a time where that was for about seven or ten days or something like that. It was like the dominant story. Um, and then we all remembered there was this outrageous title battle that was only getting more ferocious. Um, I think Russell to Mercedes is, is huge because uh, it gives a lot of people what they want, which is that two alpha drivers in the same team situation, Hamilton up against Russell, a generational shift within the same team. We've had Hamilton versus Verstappen in two different teams this year. Next year, we'll get Hamilton. They're ganging up on him. He's even got one inside his own team now. I don't. How can you look past that as the um, as the biggest move? There are the others. Are the others are quite interesting. It'd be interesting to see how Bottas tries to reinvent himself at Alfa Romeo. Albon's comeback is 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 kind of cool, and I'm glad that he'll be doing it in an environment outside of that Red Bull family. Um, and Joe, I, I I joke, I, not out of 
disrespect towards him. He's clearly a very competent driver and he's far from the most offensive driver to get into F1. But if you're going to seriously try and tell me he deserves to be in F1 over Oscar Piastri, then I'm not willing to have the conversation with you because I won't be able to take what you say seriously, to be honest. So I can't consider that to be the biggest, even though it's going to have huge ramifications for F1 in terms of we'll probably get a second race in China now, for example. So, so it is big in its own way. But just from a pure sporting point, how can you how can you think anything tops Russell to Mercedes? Come on, Glenn, have you got a contrary view on this one? Let's have a good debate. Yeah, Glenn, come on, Glenn, let's hear your argument for Guan Yu Zhou. I should have come up with a, a fictional fifth option, shouldn't I? Just to see how many people would, would vote for that, just for the sake of variety. What I would say is, anyone who remembers us doing this... Uh, this experiment last year, it wouldn't be right if there wasn't a George Russell Mercedes-related option winning a poll comprehensively. Um, Yeah, obviously it doesn't relate to the Sakia Grand Prix, so that's a shame, but it's, in a way, it was when we put these options together, you realise how brilliant the 2020 to 21 driver market was with so much going on, and how this one was actually a bit flat. And without without the Russell to Mercedes story, which, as Scott says, in the build-up to that being made official, even when everybody felt it was inevitable, every time there was even the slightest comment about it, the world went mad. Everybody was was desperate for it to be to be made official. It's going to be fascinating to see how George gets on. It was it was even cool seeing him driving the Mercedes again at the Abu Dhabi tyre test. Um after the final race of the season. So it's going to be really interesting to see what happens there. He's going to have to hit the ground running because if if Mercedes and Hamilton have challenges coming at them from all angles or even just Verstappen and Red Bull as, as competitive as they were this year, Mercedes can't afford to kind of let George get up to speed and not push him into a support role like we've seen for Bottas if he's not right on it immediately. The other big question is, if he is on it immediately, how quickly will he be taking points off of Hamilton? That's a problem Lewis hasn't really had to deal with in the last few years. But this was the right decision. I think Mercedes said that Lewis was involved in the talks about it. They obviously, I assume, wanted to be quite careful with how they managed bringing what they hope will be a future superstar driver into the team. Um, because they've seen the damage two top drivers going at it could do during the Hamilton and Rosberg years. But it is time to look ahead. And I'd imagine deep down Lewis is is relishing the challenge. But I imagine he'll also be pretty frustrated if, if him and George are sharing out some wins early in the season. And that's allowing Max perhaps to get, to get away. Um, I think it's interesting that Albon was second in this vote. Um, I'm not going to let Ed go to Valtteri Bottas' sympathy corner again. I think that reflects the fact that people people didn't like the way Albon lost his place on the grid, even though Red Bull were right to, to look for an upgrade. But for him to fall off the grid entirely, he's a likeable character. And people perhaps felt he wasn't treated that fairly. So that, even getting 10% of this vote alongside Mercedes signing a new driver, um, I think is is significant. And it'll be really interesting to see how Albon does and how Williams do how are they going to handle the new regs how are they going to handle life after George Russell he's been the guy dragging that car into regular Q2s and a few Q3s um, as it got more competitive they need to stay on an upward curve and it's up to Alex I believe to to lead the charge for them now yeah I'm not going to attempt to disagree with George Russell's landslide in this one but all of these driver moves they've all got interesting factors Bottas to Alfa Romeo he's got potential to have a bigger impact on the team there given the the struggles they've had with their drivers and where that team's coming from Alex Albon really came from nowhere to to grab that Williams seat so resurrecting a career and Guan Yu Zhou hugely important for China but also a driver who has real ability a good intelligent approach as well he did a good job when he had his FP1 outing in Austria for Alpine so interested to see how he gets on in terms of our community comments backing George Russell as the winner Roger Horton said such an opportunity but also such pressure it will be one of 2022's biggest stories E Bergman says future world champion goes to best team 
what's not to like. Jamsler said, surely this isn't a debate outside of China. And Neil Macy says Hamilton might never get his eighth championship because his teammate should be a much stronger challenger than Bottas. Jared Madsen says nothing bigger than a driver going from the back of the grid to the front. Elliot Crossan says, you didn't even need to ask this. Russell is a rising star moving to the team who by rights have eight consecutive drivers and constructors championships. Let's see how he compares to the greatest of all time. Magnus Tan said, George and Mercedes was on the cards for so long that to be honest I wasn't surprised when it was announced it's definitely the highest profile driver move for 2022 but Albin to Williams is one I did not see coming at all Lucas Dabru said Russell to Mercedes was not only expected, it was one year overdue. And CTAA says, I believe Russell will be mighty in the in the Mercedes and will push Hamilton and Max next season. And finally, Kevin Rogan says it will be great to see Russell giving Hamilton some genuine competition. So lots of excitement there about what George Russell could achieve next year. A extremely good driver. Well, thanks very much to everyone who voted for our 2021 verdict. Please do keep the conversation going, whether it's in the YouTube comments here or in our YouTube community section where you'll still find all of the polls. We spent the whole year giving you our opinion and it's always great to hear what you all think. Make sure you check therace.com and don't forget the hyphen for all the latest from the world of F1 because there's always plenty to read there. And make sure you check on our sister podcasts, including Bring Back V10s. And for those of you watching on YouTube, if you haven't already done so, make sure you hit like and subscribe. That's it for our 2021 season verdict, but make sure you're following what's going on in 2022 so you can think about where you're going to vote this time next year. As I've said, this is now an annual tradition. And in the meantime, make sure you stay with us on the Race F1 podcast for everything you need to know about the new season.